Live Season 2 of The Gorilla Report. My name is Ollie Harper and we are back for another instalment of the latest professional wrestling talk show which comes to you every single Friday night here on YouTube.com. Now this week we have got an absolutely loaded show, not going to lie. We have got of course the second and final part of the Lance Hoyt interview. In this part of the interview he talks about his time getting into the WWE from leaving TNA to uh, also working on the ECW brand, working in the past developmental system of Florida Championship Wrestling to much more current stuff of course working in New Japan Pro Wrestling right now with the British Bulldog's son Harry Smith as the Killer Elite Squad. Those guys are doing some absolutely fantastic fantastic stuff. He talks about all of that, so that's coming up in a little bit. We've also got the TNA news for this week, because I know TNA, there's been a lot of news going on in TNA this week, and I really wanted to discuss it, of course, just coming off the major event of Bound for Glory. We've also got the WWE news for this week, and of course, we're going to be showing you a little bit more of course the future previews of future guests that are going to be coming to the Gorilla Report in the next couple of weeks. So guys, when we come back after this, we're going to be doing the WWE news. We'll be back in just a little bit. So it's now the WWE news portion of the show and uh, there's a few things I want to talk about. The first of them being that the news that's been reported this past week, the WWE apparently over-exaggerated the time that John Cena was going to be out on an injury. The reason they did this was to make Cena look like a superhuman coming into the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view. But I think it's a pretty cool idea that they've done this. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, having, you know, going out there and saying it's going to take six, you know, six, seven months for Cena to be fully recovered from this uh, injury and that he would probably have been back around the Royal Rumble time to suddenly them saying, yeah, he's going to be back in, what, two, three months. I think it's very cool and, uh, hey, they had me fooled and, uh, you know what, it's going to be nice to see John Cena back at uh, the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view and that's the thing. One thing that I was a little bit like when it happened, when Cena announced that he was having to take some time off for the recovery of his injury and the fans were cheering and it's like, what does this guy really need to do to, you know, what does he need to do to, to you know, and I know there's a lot of people that don't like John Cena. You know, I'm not a bandwagon guy, but what I will say is that with John Cena for me, he's earned my respect. He really has, there's no doubt about it. I was one of these guys that did boo John Cena in the early days, you know, I always booed him saying I've seen, I've seen enough and all that rubbish. But over time John Cena has proven he's still here, he's one of the hardest working men in the WWE, he does the, he does the Make-A-Wish Foundation, he's all for the kids, he's all, he's all for all of that, he's a very marketable guy and let's be honest, have we seen another guy yet that could really fill John Cena's shoes? I don't think so. You know what? And, and that's the thing. The WWE really does need John Cena right now. It's it's no surprise they need him. And I think that when he does return at Hell in a Cell, you know what? It's, it's going to be nice to see Cena. He really is that guy that he's one of the hardest working men in the business, without a doubt. People can say what they want about John Cena, saying he's not the best wrestler or... But he, come on, he's a, you know, I think he's actually a pretty good wrestler. I mean, that's just my opinion. I think he's had some great matches in the last couple of years with the likes of CM Punk, The Rock, Daniel Bryan, you know. And I, hopefully we see Cena go up against somebody like The Undertaker at 30. I think that would be an absolutely tremendous idea. Uh, something that's never been done before. And I, well, it has been done before, yes. But uh, on the grandest stage of them all with these two guys in the parts of their career, a guy like The Undertaker who's winding down, to somebody like John Cena who, you know, is very much now in his prime I would say. Um, I would be very, um, I would be very much ready to see this match as a, as a fan. 
Anyway, other news to report this week, it would seem that Vince McMahon has an idea of wanting to bring back some of the old WCW pay-per-views into the 2014 pay-per-view calendar. Apparently he uh, wants to bring back the War Games pay-per-view and Bash at the Beach. Now in terms of the War Games pay-per-view, I think that's quite a likely idea in a lot of ways. I mean, with the success of the Best of War Games, pe well, the Best of War Games DVD that was released earlier on this year, I think that bringing a a war game style pay-per-view to the WWE could be very much well received. Um, it's never, you know, having something that's been done like 15, 16 years ago, re reincarnating it on WWE would be pretty cool. And they, you know, there's a lot of ways that they could put, put a lot of angles into a war game style match. I think it could do very well in the long run. Um, but Bash at the Beach, maybe that would just be like a summer idea, just have it sort of in there, perhaps before the Summer Slam or. I don't know, but I would definitely go that uh, the War Games pay-per-view is a lot more, I would say, definitely much more of a likely sort of thing that we may see in the uh, in the future. But uh, that's about everything, guys. That is the WWE news for this week. When we get back after this, guys, we're going to be doing the TNA wrestling news. We will be back in just a little bit. guys, so it is now the TNA wrestling news portion of the show, and uh, there's a few things to mention this week, of course, with TNA just coming off the heels of their biggest pay-per-view of the year in Bound for Glory. First thing to mention, it would seem that TNA are definitely going to be taking TNA off, well, they're going to be taking Impact off the road as of the start of November. They're going to be going back to a secured location, it seems returning to Orlando, Florida, perhaps at the Universal Studios. Um, in terms of this move, I think that, you know, if, you know what, if it's going to be a much more of a financial benefit to them, then definitely go for it. I think that uh, as much as it was definitely cool seeing TNA in these big arenas, you know what, I mean, at the end of the day, if this company wants to uh, stay afloat, you know, moving it back to a secure location is definitely going to be a good idea all round. Um, but with Impact this week, you know what, we saw a few good things. I mean, of course, we saw the return of Mr. Anderson. It would seem that they have definitely now secured a new contract with Mr. Anderson, which is a good thing because I think that uh, when Mr. Anderson left, it was like, come on, guys, you know. But with Mr. Anderson back, hopefully now we can see this guy getting pushed more into the, uh, the main top world title picture, which is definitely a good thing. Also, stuff to mention this week, AJ Styles had obviously won the, uh, won the big one at Bound for Glory off Bully Ray, winning the world title. And then at the end of this week's impact, he uh, took the belt, got in this, got in this car that uh, Dixie had given him as a gift, and uh, drove out. So it seems as though now he's doing a runner. But uh, in terms of where they're going to go with this, could be quite interesting. You know, AJ Styles walking out, you know, walking out of TNA and... Uh, bit like the whole Summer of Punk storyline being well, reincarnated, but uh, you know it's going to be interesting to see how TNA decides to run this one really. Um, they could really go to the extremes with this and take Styles, put him in another promotion. I mean, if there's any uh, organizations out there that are quite, you know, they've got a pretty good relationship with TNA, you know, and how Styles just turn up at another completely other promotion with the belt, you know, really put it into the storyline, I think it'd be really cool to see. Uh, other stuff to mention, of course, Ethan Carter the third made his debut at this past Sunday's Bound for Glory, aka WWE NXT star Derek Bateman. Um, I know this guy's received quite a lot of negativity in the last couple of weeks when it was coming up to his uh, debut, but uh, from seeing this guy, I think, you know what, I'm going to give him a chance. I really am. I think he's a pretty good wrestler, and his character, I, you know what, I, it's, it's, I'm, I'm quite over with it. I think it'll be a pretty, you know, it's going to be one of these things that I think people will definitely... Uh, get to with you know within time and uh, you know he's one of these guys that's definitely going to grow on me I think but uh, you know that's pretty much everything guys that is the TNA news for this week and when we get back after this guys speaking of TNA we've actually got the second part of the interview with former TNA star Lance Hoyt he's going to be with us very well he's coming up next on the Gorilla Report <laughs> So, 
so from CNN, of course, you <laughs> took quite a leap, we could say, yep. of course, uh, to the place that every professional wrestler out there wants to try and end up somewhere in their career is, of course, the WWE. Mm -hmm. um, please tell me through the day when you find out that uh, they come calling and they want to sign you up to their uh, in the FCW. Talk me through that. How was uh, you know getting the, you know signing up to WWE? You know, that all kind of came in a whirlwind quickness of my TNA time coming to a close because, yeah. um, you know, they wouldn't actually talk to me directly because I was still on a contract with TNA, but it was known that my TNA contract would be ending. Like, we, we taped my last episode of Impact on a Tuesday. My contract was going to go null and void on that Wednesday. Yeah. I'd gotten that information out into the right people in WWE. So they had me come down to Florida on a Thursday um, and basically do an open kind of tryout. You know, they, they knew who I was and they knew kind of what they had seen, but they wanted to, I think, kind of see where I was at and what kind of attitude I had and things like that. Because they unfortunately had some other guys that had come in and it didn't necessarily work out. Sure. Um, so, like I said, on Tuesday I filmed for Impact. On Wednesday I was free and clear of my contract. On Thursday I tried out. Um, and the next week was when I got the phone call that said that they wanted to hire me, um, but they were wanting to me to go and work in their uh, FCW, their developmental territory for a time being, which I didn't think it is a bad thing. A lot of people had said, well, why are they doing that to you? Why do you have to go do that? And, you know, I saw it as a transition period. I saw it as an opportunity to kind of learn what their company was about, what they wanted from me and yeah. the, to have the best opportunity and success. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it was a really, like I said, it was a whirlwind of things. It went from one week with one company to the next week with the other company as soon as my contract cleared and they saw potential in what they had seen from me. I'm sorry, I can't yeah. speak correctly. Yeah. Um, say, I'm saying, touching on, of course, of what they've got now, of course, they're doing <clears throat> the, uh, the WWE Performance Center. And mm -hmm. of course, that's really what's they revolved the uh, developmental so damn much. I mean, they're still doing the NXT stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's really, of course, touching on, of course, names. I mean, names in WWE. Some of the times when a guy like yourself or somebody will, you know, get signed up to WWE, they have to go mm -hmm. to the developmental. They give them some of the most uh, craziest names going. I mean, of course, you mm -hmm. were Lance Hoyt, and I think a lot of fans mm -hmm. were thinking you were going to stay as Lance Hoyt. And then they changed mm -hmm. you to Vance Archer. Um, mm -hmm. The name... Well, who came up with that name and, you know, that whole idea? Was there any sort of real story to that with the name change? Uh, Vance Archer was a collaboration. You know, it's one of the things that now with WWE, they're very much on the copyright. Uh, yeah. They, they want to own the name. Yeah. Um, so pretty much everybody that comes into the company now, even even people who have name value from their family behind them, yeah. are, are, are having to change their names. There's very few guys that have gotten to keep their real names. Um, and I was not one of the people going to be able to keep my real name. Yeah. Uh, Vance Archer was a collaboration. Vance was a name that was chosen by Dusty Rhodes. Um, you know, I'd gone through a bunch of different names that I had tried to get. Um, he wanted Vance, and he had a different last name, but my father's name is actually Archer. So I actually asked for Archer to be the, the last name. And Vance is obviously a play on Lance. So Vance and Archer, Vance Archer. Okay, okay. Have you... Um Say something on FCW. Have you got any good uh, memories or any little things you want to talk about with the FCW uh, experience? Of course, being in that sort of, you know, that little thing before you do hit the main WWE TV. Uh, to say working right. FCW. Have you got any good experiences you want to share from FCW? Oh yeah, I mean, I made some really, really, really good friends there. Uh, Tyler Rex, um, you know, who's not with the company anymore. Byron Saxton, who yeah. still is down in Florida, with, working with them on more of a. Um, corporate side now, I guess you could say, um, you know, these guys became really, really close friends of mine. And, you know, we're there on a daily basis with these people. So uh, you really get to know these people. Plus, you know, Dr. Tom Pritchard, um, who's always awesome, amazing, you know, very straightforward, very honest. And I always appreciated that. Dusty Rhodes, you know, he was always a supporter of mine. I think he's one of the bigger reasons I got an opportunity to go and work with the company in the first place. Um, you know, Norman Smiley, yeah. Steve Kern, all these guys that were there 
were extremely instructive uh, and, and helpful and, and people truly being developed because I think they wanted to see each and every person have an opportunity to be successful because yeah. if they were successful, then it meant they were being successful trainers, you know, so they were always very helpful, especially if you showed any desire to really be there and work hard because they had so many guys and girls there that, you know, if you didn't take the time, they weren't going to waste their time on you or with you. If you took time to try to learn and do stuff and become something more, then they wanted to take that time with you. And so that's what really stood out with me as far as my time in FCW were the guys and girls who were there to work hard and the ones who tried to help me and, and whatnot. So those are my best experiences, I think, coming out of FCW. Um, of course, and then you would be moved up to the, uh, at the time, they're not actually running it now, but uh, the new ECW brand. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we'll say, you, you, you said earlier, you know, you hadn't watched the original ECW. So, right. you know, you didn't really have that sort of thing of what was, you know, what they had been pretty much been perceived as on the old days, of course. But this, right. this new ECW very much was to showcase you know the younger talent at the time like somebody like a like a Seamus or a, mm -hmm. um it say guys down there say CM Punk, John Morrison, Elijah yep. Burke, uh, yep. of course, you know, and you you really going up to the ECW say how was ECW for you? New ECW? Well, I think just what you said it was the main reason for ECW existing, and I think it was a great opportunity for guys like you know, like you said, the names that you just mentioned: CM Punk, uh, Kofi Kingston, uh, John Morrison, uh, you know, Zack Ryder, and, and Kurt Hawkins started there with as the Major Brothers. You know, um, you have so many guys that had their first opportunities on ECW, and with Raw being a live show, it was a very limited show as far as guys who got to be a part of it. Even with SmackDown being taped, it was still, you know, it was only two hours long, and it was a limited opportunity, and the main stars were a part of that. So ECW was a great opportunity for guys who were scrounging for spots for an opportunity for any kind of TV time. Instead of just getting, you know, 30 seconds backstage, now you actually had full ring time and match time and an opportunity to develop characters. Yeah. Um, I think it was invaluable. You know, there was a lot of backlash on, oh, this is an ECW. That's not what ECW was. And it's like, yeah, okay, I understand that. But what it is now is an opportunity for you to get to know and love the stars that are going to be that next generation, you know. And, um, you know, the guys that are the top guys now are many of the same guys that went through that ECW product. So it was, it was invaluable. And it was really kind of, for guys like myself, disappointing when they decided to change it to what they did now. Yeah. It became a whole new opportunity for a whole new crew of guys, but for the guys who were trying to cut their teeth, learn their craft, earn their place uh, with the WWE product on their television program, ECW was a great place. And when it went away, it took, I think it took a lot of opportunities out of the guys who were already there and trying yeah. to earn that. Now, okay, say so then once after ECW, um, mm -hmm. you moved up to the SmackDown brand. Um, yep. Whose decision was that to really move you up to SmackDown and go, you know what, it's time to see what you can do on our, you know, on the Friday night show uh, of SmackDown? Well, uh, with ECW shut down, I think it kind of forced yeah, the issue. Course, it was like, yeah. all right, do we just kind of send him back down? Or since he's yeah. already kind of been there, do we wait for that real opportunity to put him on our SmackDown show? And, you know, I had some people who were behind me at the time, the reasons I even got brought up to TV in the first place that were kind of, the, the SmackDown writers, and I think they were just looking for an opportunity. But, you know, it's like I said, it, it's jam packed with a lot of guys. Um, the opportunities are few and far between. Yeah. Um, it, took, it took about three, four months before I even got an opportunity to be put on SmackDown when they teamed Kurt Hawkins and I. Um, you know, and even then, uh, our debut was on Superstars. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was one of those things where we had a very positive debut. There was nothing wrong with it, but I don't think, in my opinion, it was just one of those situations where. Um, I, maybe if a little more time had been taken, it would have possibly uh, been something bigger. You know, we were doing really good at first, and we had our first opportunity on Superstars, and then we had our first opportunity on SmackDown. Um, but as the business is, there were a lot of things going on. We were going into SummerSlam at, at, at some point soon, so, you know, our possible momentum was kind of slowed down because yeah. we were, I don't know, I don't know how else to put it. You know, yeah. they, they had other storylines going on so we were there and we were a part of things but we were kind of a, a, a side note and you know you only get so much time and so many opportunities yeah of course and then of course it was uh you're pretty much put on the back burner is it's one i'm going to say really they say the back burner treatment mm -hmm. a lot of the uh to a lot of the writing that was going on at the time this was uh, i believe this was 2010 i believe it was two, yes, 2010 yeah yeah um so 
your release from WWE, yep. um, what was it? Was it, uh, was it was it telephone? Was it a thing where you went down to Stanford and got told? How did the release uh, come about? Uh, just just a just a phone call. That's pretty so, much how they do it um, now, and yeah. it was kind of out of nowhere. And you know, I, I, I guess I'd kind of seen the writing on the wall with yeah. the things that that were not happening to say the more so. Um, yeah. But at the same time, you know, there's a lot of guys who go through different phases in the business with them. There are guys that are still under contract with that company that you may not even know they're still there and they're on the road every week. And, you know, with that company, a lot of times it's just time and opportunity. If you're given the time and the opportunity or opportunities, there's a possible chance that you could actually do something and become something. You know, there's a lot of guys who um, have started on TV there, then they've taken off TV, then they come back to TV and maybe they go off TV again. And, you know, maybe their characters change, the name changes, the direction changes, yeah. you know, and if you're, if you're given enough time and, uh, and possible opportunities, you know, there's a chance, but sometimes the company has to make decisions. Um, when I was released, that was a part of, if I remember correctly, it was like nine, nine, nine or ten ref wrestlers. There was a referee or two. There were several writers. So there was probably about fifteen people within a week and a half period that got released all at the same time. So, you know, it's kind of an age old thing. You know, that's a it's a uh, financial decision. But I think at this time it kind of was, and they were just going, we have to cut X amount of people. And unfortunately, my name got put on that list. Of course, yeah. I mean, they're saying, but. Uh... With WWE, of course, mm -hmm. we're now going to touch on now your your Japanese stuff. Um, mm -hmm. With where you are now in your in your current you know in your current thing, would you know, if WWE ever came back to you and said you know would you like to come back? Would you would would you want to go back to WWE if there was an opportunity there? Yeah, I think it's one of those situations where you know if I truly was given an opportunity, I would hold absolutely nothing back. It would be one of those situations where. If they called and they said, hey, let's go, and it was the right situation for both them and me, obviously, yeah. uh, together, it would be, for me, it would be a situation where they, they would have to kick me out of the building to not let me be successful. Yeah. Um, but it, for me, I think it would be a prideful thing. And I'd like to go back and have an opportunity to show them that they've and they made a mistake in the past, that what I can and will be is something special in the business. Um, so if I had an opportunity, I think I would go back, but right now I think everything in Japan has been awesome. Japan has given me, uh, an opportunity that I've never had in my career to this point. So, you know, I'm really happy doing what I'm doing and working with New Japan Pro Wrestling. It's been an awesome, amazing company to be a part of. So, so it's just nice to talk about, uh, talk mm -hmm. about Japan. Um, the thing with Japan, was it a thing that, uh, did they, was it like they came to you and were like, were you given the opportunity, was it something that you were like, you started to get your, your feelers out and you were like, I want to mm -hmm. pursue on this Japanese trip and, you know, try a New Japan Pro Wrestling? Um, you know, it, like I said, before I even got released from TNA, I was working in Japan. So I've made some connections there. And the yeah. business is very much an entertainment business, whereas a lot of the opportunities you receive are because of the people that you know and the relationships you make. Yeah. Um, I've met a lot of the right people. I, I, I got my opportunities in TNA because of the relationships I made. I got my opportunities in WWE because of the relationships I'd made with people. Um, and the, the Japan thing was kind of the same scenario. I've gotten in contact with some of the same people I've worked with prior uh, to going to WWE um, and had them put out the feelers. I also had some WWE people that made some phone calls or sent some emails for me to New Japan. So it was a collaboration of a lot of people you know, choosing to to help me and and myself choosing to help myself. I don't know if I said that correctly by getting those feelers out. So the first opportunity with New Japan was kind of uh, in their mind uh, a tryout. You know, I was only booked for one show. Um, it was for a pay per view show that they had in Osaka, Japan. Yeah. Um, when they were coming to the states, they did three shows in on the East Coast: two in New York, one in Philadelphia. Um, to help set up me going to Japan, they asked me to come out to Philadelphia and do a run-in spot. And uh, once I got to, to the arena, there was actually people at New Japan that I'd already met, and they knew me and I knew them. But yeah. just through phone conversations, we didn't even realize we were talking to the same people. Um, and so it just helped comfort that situation and that changeover and more. And then when I went to Japan, I, I 
would like to think that the match I had was really strong and the, they saw a lot of potential in what I brought to them. And, you know, so they wanted to do more. And actually that one match was turned into a, a week and a half period where I stayed over and did some more stuff on um, some, some a, a small short tour is what I ultimately ended up doing instead of just one show. Okay, so uh, talking about the Japanese experience, they're working in Japan, how, how could you compare or say you've been in WWE, you've been in TNA, now you're working in New Japan. How could you compare both experiences, really? You know, sort of on the comparing of both of them, the experiences in both places. As far as what do you mean, both places? In terms of like uh, how really just I would say more about like the behind the scenes for say a show of New Japan mm -hmm. is something in say WWE or TNA that kind of. What I'm saying, really, like in terms of your your uh, com compare them both, really. Um, you know, I mean, it, Japan is a definitely it, it's a it's a different market. You know, okay. their focus is more so on the wrestling aspect. Yeah. Um, the the guys who are running New Japan now, the bookers are very, very smart. Um, the one thing that they've done really, really well in the past two years, especially since I've been there and then, you know, some time before that, was they really started adopting a little bit more of a Western style with characters and trying to draw the crowd in emotionally along with having some amazing wrestling that's going on every time that the guys step out there and have a show. Um, as far as the backstage stuff, you know, it, it doesn't feel like there's as much politics yeah. happening in Japan, um, it, it's very much, you know, if you go out there and you perform, you're rewarded for it. Um, you know, and that's just kind of the Japanese nature. If you come in and you show respect and you do well, you're going to be rewarded for it. But that being said, it's still professional wrestling. It's still the entertainment business. They're still looking for the best entertainment product that they can put out there. Um, they're backstage uh, as far as like character-based stuff yeah. is not as extensive as TNA or WWE is. There's not a lot of backstage interviews. There's not a lot of um, backstage character development. It's more just, you know, you are having a fight with who you're having a fight with, and you may say something before the fight. You may have a press conference or something oh. of that nature, and then you have your fight, and then whatever the outcome of the fight is, you usually do a small interview post-fight um, and you base those feelings on, you know, what happened? Did you win? Did you lose? Uh, is the storyline furthered with what happened? Who knows? Um, but it's more straightforward. I guess that's the best way to say it. It's more straightforward in, in Japan and in New Japan as to who you're fighting, what you're fighting for, and when you're going to fight. Whereas in TNA and WWE, being that they're more entertainment specific especially wwe you know it's more about the character development the storylines sure. that are going on the emotions that you're trying to draw out of the people even before a match or fight even happens where like i said in, yeah. in japan it's more just i'm fighting you today i'm kicking your butt and then we're out there we have our fight and i either kicked your butt or you kicked mine or something happened where we're gonna fight again okay you beat me i'm really mad we're gonna fight again or i beat you you're never gonna get a chance again and they're going yes i am we're gonna fight again you know it's it's very simple and straightforward but the fans really they love it they have a great time um you know cork and hall in japan is the equivalency i think of the ecw the old ecw arena in philadelphia uh, that people, you know, love so much and, you know, the, the fan base in, in Japan and Tokyo at the Cork and Hall is just, it's electrifying. You know, it's, it's one of the smaller buildings and only fits about 2,000 at capacity, but when it's full and the people are rocking, it is an awesome, awesome yeah, place and experience to be a part of. I can just imagine that atmosphere being so, uh, so, so electric, say, very cliche saying, but so electrifying, you know, and I think that that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's very nice to uh, to really experience with the the Japanese super shows. Um, right. What I want to do now, I want to actually, I want to say, a couple, I'm going to drop a couple of names, say from the Japanese stuff, and I really want you to just give me a little sentence, a little kind of like word word name association. I'm going to drop a couple of na names in there and tell oh. me, you know, sort of a thing with these guys. Um, okay. Okay. So uh, Carl Anderson, the Machine Gun. Oh yeah, Carl. <laughs> he's he's awesome, funny. Uh, he's one of those guys that's, you know, if he had been given a real opportunity in the States, and I think he's been doing some stuff more with Ring of Honor lately, so people are starting to see the, the coolness, the craziness, the greatness that Carl Anderson actually is. Yeah. And, you know, he's really cut his teeth and learned his ways in Japan. And backstage, he's probably one of the funniest guys in the business. For sure, for sure. Okay. Uh, a, a guy, of course, uh, Prince Devitt, Fergal Devitt. Oh, 
you know, if AJ Styles is phenomenal, this kid is as phenomenal, yeah. if not more. You know, he's athletically gifted, physically gifted. He's got an ability that's second to none in the world. Um, you know, he's he's if New Japan's smart, they'll lock him into a contract he can't get out of and won't want to leave with. And uh, one more, of course, uh, with going over as well, MVP, Montel Vontavious Porter. You know, the MVP that I got to know in Japan was a really, really cool dude. We had some really strong matches. We actually got to work uh, on the last day of the G1 finals last year. Not this not this year we just had, but the year before. Um, and we had an awesome, fun opening opening match, too. You know, it's one of those matches that's kind of important, I think, in the wrestling business. Uh, and we tore it up. We had a great match, you know. So the, yeah. the MVP that I got to meet in Japan was a very different guy and a very cool cat. Tremendous. Now... Of course, you're in a tag team, we'll say, running up also with uh, the British Bulldogs' son, of course, Harry Smith. Yep. Uh, very cool, the saying that uh, uh, okay, Dave, David Boy Smith Jr., uh, the, killer, yep. the Killer Elite Squad, K-E-S for an acronym. Yep. Uh, the name, very cool little name, to say, how is mm -hmm. it sort of you two getting together? Talk me through that. How is it getting together with uh, Davey Boy? Well, you know, again, like most of the tag teams that I've been a part of, they've just kind of been thrown together. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I've been working with the company for about a year at this time. Uh, I, they told me that they were wanting to bring Harry in, and they told me that they wanted us to tag together. And, you know, I, I didn't know how that was going to be at first. You know, I, I knew Harry and a little bit from our WWE time. I would worked with him a couple times in WWE. Um, but I didn't know if our characters were going to match. You know, I've done a lot to create the American Psycho Lance Archer I was a part of Suzuki Goon. You still are a part of Suzuki Goon. And, you know, our, our characters are just kind of, they're very strong, badass, mafioso type guys. Uh, you know, and mine was just kind of the monster that didn't didn't care about anybody or anything. And I just wanted to hurt people. And then I, you know, I, I knew Harry's wrestling ability was top notch. I knew that he could step in the ring and wrestle with anybody out there. And, you know, he's got a shoot background that gives him legitimacy that a lot of guys don't necessarily have in the business, but I didn't know if our characters were going to match. But I think the one thing that helped Harry and I, especially when he came into new Japan was neither one of us had an ego about each other. We just wanted to be successful. And this is what we were asked to do. We were asked to be a part of a tag team. So we did a lot of things to work together um, to try to make, our tag team successful the KES name Killer League Squad yeah. it was a name that we came up with together we discussed several different names um, and we decided on that one together a lot of the moves that we do as a team we discuss them we talk about them he has his ideas I have my ideas but we work together and we try to come up with the best possible uh, team effort in every sense and I think that's what's making it work so well mm -hmm. neither one of us is trying to overshadow the other one you know we're not trying to leave somebody behind by using the team to advance ourselves we're trying to work together to advance the team because i think we both know if the team advances then most likely both of us will advance as individuals along as being a team right. now my opinion of harry is that new japan has something special um in him he's a young kid i mean he just turned 28 i think um <laughs> at 28 years old six foot five massive dude he's i mean he's got the pro wrestling skill behind him he's got the shoot background to give him legitimacy he's learning to be the character you know that he's becoming especially in japan uh i think he's a, he's a diamond in the rough he's something that if new japan again another guy if they're smart he could easily be uh, a gaijin heavyweight champion for them in the future you know i I'd like to think myself will be there, and I'm going to work for that in every sense for someday in the future. But I think he, especially because of his age, his ability, his physical presence, everything that he has, he truly can be a world champion for them one time. Definitely, definitely. Very much built like his father, I would say. A lot of people yeah. always said that. Very much built like the late, great British Bulldog. Yep. Um, and that's not touching on another thing completely. But uh, of course, now, uh, say Harry Smith's actually coming to the UK in, I believe, a couple of months. Would yeah. you, uh, are you at all wanting to come back to the UK at all anytime soon to do any wrestling over here on, on our on our shores? I'd love to. You know, I, I you know, unfortunately, I haven't even had the opportunity since my WWE time, and that was just a very short time. Um, yeah. You know, it's one of those things that Harry and I's schedules have always kind of conflicted with each other. You know, he lives in Tampa, I live here in Texas. Um, you know, he has the companies that he's been working with on a regular basis. I have the companies I've been working with on a regular basis. So it's been real hard 
getting he and I scheduled to coincide so that we can go do something that like like that. But I would love to. I would love to come and take KES all around the world. I'd love for him and I to be able to sync our schedules and just travel around the U.S. and the U.K. and Canada and Japan and Mexico and wherever as a tag team and just kind of take over the world in tag team action. It'd be a lot of fun. I was going to start wrapping this up now. Um, okay. so, so your final, let's say, c current projects. Anything you really want to plug and get out there on this interview? Or any current projects you've got going on? Yeah, you know, I work with a company in the states. It's called TCW Tech Tra Tra Traditional Championship Wrestling. Yeah. Um, they do have a television, a uh, national television market here in the USA. Um, it's a company that's really working hard to make wrestling prevalent in the United States of America. And they're an awesome company that I've been working with. They're growing. There's a lot of good guys that are out there. Um, I will be working in November with Tommy Dreamer's House of Hardcore. He's already had two of those shows. They've gotten a lot of positive reviews. Uh, and I'm lucky enough to be a part of that in November. Um, you know, and those are two of the main projects I've got going on in the USA right now. And then, I, I, I'm sorry, I have to, I, I didn't want to leave this out. I shouldn't have even overlooked this. You know, Harry and I are still tag champs right now. Okay. We are the NWA World Tag Team Champions right now. And the NWA itself, the guys who are running it, the guys who took it over are awesome guys. Uh, Bruce Tharp, Chris Ronquillo, these guys are doing the right things with a company and a name, you know, the NWA historically is one of the strongest names that has been in business. It's dropped off a lot since then, uh, but they're doing a lot of things to try to get that back in the prevalence and make the NWA a big and awesome thing. And, you know, Harry and I are kind of a part of that and helping branch out and become a bigger deal. Very cool. I hear, I, hear the, I, saying, I hear your dog in the background. He, 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 yeah. wants to, he wants to come in the interview, I think, for a bit. <laughs> they're, they're kind of mad at me. They're like, get off the dang phone. <laughs> no, that's cool. It's cool. Um, so have you got any like, little final message you want to uh, say to the fans that are watching this? You got any final words you want to say? Yeah, I just want to tell the fans thank you. Thank you for being fans. Thank you for enjoying the business. Thank you for supporting the independents all the way up into WWE. Thank you for checking out New Japan on YouTube and Daily Motion, for looking us up online and watching the iPay per views. You know, without the fans, there is no business and they're the lifeblood. So I guess part of thanking them is also asking them to start looking for that next superstar, that next generation superstar, somebody that they can latch on to love and enjoy in the business because I think there's too many people that are very negative and cynical about the business today. There's a lot of people who seem to complain about this, that, and the other, and they want to complain about everything they see on TV, but that's only hurting the business. So I'm asking the fans, we need you. Uh, we love you. We're glad that you're there, but we also want you to go out there and find that next generation superstar that you can love and support. And, and I want to ask, I want to ask the fans to stop being so negative and look for the positive because yeah. without them, there is no business. There you go. There you go. I think that's a great way to really just put the, uh, the full stop on this is definitely, you know, go out there and just find the positives. Definitely. Yeah. Um, but I just want to say a very big, big thank you to Mr. Lance Hoyt for coming on the show today. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honor talking to you about your time on the road and uh, working in all these great companies. And uh, of course, I just want to say I want to wish you all of the all the best in your uh, your future. And I just hope the future gets brighter and brighter for you, man. Thank you very much. I'm not I'm not stopping anytime soon. Oh man. no, of course not, of course not. But uh, say I hope you know the Japan you know the Japan thing keeps going for you really good, and it'd be nice to I say it'd be nice to see you in the UK at some point uh, down the road. I think it'd be great to see uh, Lance Hoy do a couple of shows down there because we've got some very good, uh, very great talents in the UK. I hope to be out there too, man. There you go, there you go. But uh, thank you very much, guys. You have been watching the Gorilla Report, and we will be back very very soon. Take care, guys.